What? What? I, we never we never bring up the fact that there's a transition. I wanted to do a transition. No. That's like the worst thing you could do. I, I'm pretty sure we already transitioned before you said that. No. no. Not, we did we did an audio transition, but not a video transition. I'm pretty sure we video transitioned. <laughs> Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, how's it going? And welcome to the phone booth. No comment here on TBOSJ, the voice of San Joaquin, and soon to be KBCC 89.5 FM, Tracy, California. Ah, oh, that's such Woo! a word sandwich. Oh my god. <laughs> my name is Edward Heitman. Joining me in the studio, as always, are my good friends and co hosts, Brian Rodriguez. Hello. And Parker Sperlin. Good evening. Tried to. Uh, oh. Try to do it. Oh, we're shaking the he's table. He's gonna destroy everything. Get oh off. my god, no. This table no. is shaking. No. We're shook. <laughs> we, we, I have we, been shook. We're, we're here. And, um, yeah. So, I need you to put your foot down, Brian. Well, I, I, I can't got... because you're on top of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was that? I'm not sure. Anyways, that was... uh, in case this is your first time Ow. tuning into the show, the phone Kick booth me. is a show that is all about the world of pop. Whoa. He's down, but I'm going to keep going. What's this, wrong with you? <laughs> this is a show that's all about the world of pop okay. culture. Anything from movies to video games to TV shows to comic books, you name it, and we will do our very best to cover it. Now, this, of course, being no comment, our, our more tangent-filled episode of the week. Are you drunk? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any, anyways... Of course, this is no comment. The episode where we go on more tangents than Ed, normal. I need you to do something for me. What do you want me to do? I need you. Let's put down the reporter atmosphere and the and, uh, pinata. I mean facade. So, just take that. Take which. Take take this idea of Walter Cronkite. I need you to do a little. A little bit of that. Too. Uh, All right. A little, uh, little bit. Of, uh, little, put your little flair on it. Put your little uh, flair on it. Uh, 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 what? Put your little flare no, on. No, I, I can't. I can't. My, my integrity. My integrity. This is I, the I man that has trouble sitting in a my chair. My integrity is threatened. Twice. Don't listen to him. <laughs> now, this is no comment, ladies and gentlemen, where I become me and you are you and I am the walrus. So, cuckoo, kachoo. Cuckoo, kachoo. Here we are. No comment. I'll be taking the reins on this one today, no. fellas. No. Oh, no. We Absolutely are, This not. is a group effort this is, today's I'll be taking, episode. I'll taking the reins on this one. If anything, I'm taking the reins in the beginning. <laughs> That's right, because we have, because if you remember from last time, uh, we didn't get to Brian's best of the worst of 2019, and then we're going to get to the, our favorite decade. That is correct. And, you know, we're going to have a lot of, you know, fancy jambalaya mm -hmm. of pop culture in this one, just talking about our great times, our worst times of 2019, and I mean... 2019 and the decade all in general. So here we go. I don't really need a strip because I had this pretty I mean, look at this. It's like 10 words. So out the door it goes. No comment. Yes. If you were tuning in to last week's episode, we had Terry Wells Brown as a guest talking about The Witcher, but we also talked about the fact that the decade was wrapping up. And we wanted to start off by going over the best of 2019 and then eventually transition over to the best of the decade. And if you were tuning in, you would have noticed that that episode was an hour and a half long. Terry mm -hmm. has got to be the best guest we've ever had on the show. Yeah, yeah hour and a half could, long. <laughs> yeah. We could, I mean, I wish we could just have kept going for like four hours. That I wish we great. could too. We that was done, just we such a good a episode. Joe Rogan Joe oh, Rogan yeah. style podcast. Just three <laughs> hours go. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, because of the fact that we had to wrap up so soon, we weren't able to really get to Brian's list. And before we even tackle the best of the decade, I feel it's important that we get to hear what you thought was the best and worst of 2019. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to admit I had to eat a lot of crow in 2019 because I was wrong about pretty much every prediction I had. Wait, you had to eat a lot of what? Crow. Uh, Nelly okay. Zapian's tuning in, saying hi to the whole group here at the phone booth. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Hello. Thank you for tuning in, as always. I'll, I'll poop smack you. Please? Yo, what? <laughs> Yo, poop smack There's you. a video of uh, some woman grabbed onto the Pope's hand, and she wouldn't let go, so he had to smack her. <laughs> he went like that. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, oh. Do you anyway, hope, best. Of 2019 for me was Watchmen, the HBO series. Yes. Ah, and what yes, I thought yes. was, when I first heard about it, I thought it was going to be an unmitigated mess, but it turned out to be probably, probably one of the best TV shows I've ever seen. It was just well, well structured. Well, the story was great. There were no real loose ends. Everything had a purpose. Everything was built towards and hinted at. It had you know commentary on current American politics through the lens of you know sci-fi american politics it was very very well done mm -hmm. 
you know i love you know like you said it all like it's kind of like this so like it start when it starts like an explosion you know everything just kind of boom happens you know it's mm -hmm. like whoa and then it all comes back together yep it was great a, a nice little resolution to everything set them up knock them down it was great Mm -hmm. And the worst of 2019 was a game I thought would set the world on fire, <laughs> and it, it did, did. Yeah. in a way, as, oh. you know, and itself, Anthem, Bioware's... I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. You, well, see, from here you'd hit your head on that chair and probably do brain damage. Oh. Like I don't we do our that. own stunts. <laughs> Anthem was supposed to be Bioware's next big RPG, a grand storytelling experiment, live service game that would last for a decade. We even we got have... a we even got a whole VR entrance at the beginning of E3 when they were talking about Anthem for EA's benefit. Yeah, yeah. and it was this amazing. It was going to be this amazing thing, and it landed, and it was just it was a nothing burger. It was pretty, and the flight controls were fun, but there was nothing to do. It was buggy. It, it was, was like a lovely bouquet mm -hmm. of nothing. Yes. Yeah. It was essentially a flight simulator with microtransactions that was trying to be so much more. Eventually, the roadmap to it was completely canceled after significant delays. There is oh, currently man, no word, no official word on the future of Anthem other than maybe. basically maintenance. There's rumors of a relaunch. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, but man. At this point, I mean... Anthem, Anthem broke my heart. I think it broke a lot of people's heart, Brian. It did. When I, I remember seeing the uh, the gameplay trailer that they had at E3 for the very first time, and all I can think of was basically the Avengers, but everybody wore an Iron Man suit. Yeah. And, and just that concept alone just sounds amazing. You had this guy that was like a Hulk Buster. You had this. You had the Wizard that reminded you that reminded me at least of Storm and whatnot. You mm -hmm. know, you had all these cool classes and whatnot and. It seemed like such a cool concept, but then there was even bugs that involved just the armor alone that you wore in that game. Yeah, you know? there were weird ones where you could put another class's armor on a different class. Yeah. Was... Yeah, by my calculations, if you look at those calculations right there, it was a disaster. So. Oh, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we've gone through my best and worst of 2019, and I had to see what Parker just put there, because he's four. <laughs> <laughs> and now we get to do everybody's best and worst of the 2010s. The last decade going from 2010 to 2019, because that's how we're defining a decade, and I refuse to get into another argument about this. <laughs> it's Now, um, I... I agree with you, Honey Bunny. Uh, yeah. So... You know, I agree with it. So, I know that my name kind of popped up at the top of the list, but honestly, I'm more interested in hearing your guys' best to worst of the decade, so... Okay, well, Parker threw away his script. Okay, so, so yeah. basically, my best of the decade is Taika Waititi, the man, mm. the myth, the legend himself, because mm -hmm. he's just made... He has been nothing but great to the movie industry. He just came in really on a wave of a myth. Me. Everyone knows he exists. He wrote in on a wave of neon and 80s pop music. Well, I mean, before that, before he did all that, he was in, he did the, um, What We Do in the Dark. Ah, oh, uh, great, a, great vampire movie. It was a great, funny little movie. Great you know? mockumentary. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, let's see. Uh, so he did that, and I really loved it. Uh, I loved his work. Uh, what's the other one? <sighs> Thor Ragnarok? There was the one before that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to remember that. I can't remember the, the name of the movie, but he did some. He did a lot of other works before that, and I enjoyed him. Uh, and then he does Thor Ragnarok, which set the world on fire. Mm -hmm. But and then he comes out with his. Uh, he comes out with his other movie, uh, Jojo Rabbit, mm -hmm. which is just great. You know, oh yeah, the satire. I love his satire. I love his comedy style. I think it's great. He's working uh, on another Thor. He's supposedly still attached to the Akira adaptation, which which got delayed. Yeah. It, he's just uh, forever. He's just refreshing. Mm -hmm. He's refreshing. This whole decade, he's just been refreshing. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Know, for the movie, I'm like, oh, thank God. Like, I thought Ragnarok was just trying to, you know, I like when I saw Ragnarok or when I saw the previews for Ragnarok, I was like, oh, is this going to be another '80s cash grab like Stranger Things or something like that? Felt like it. Uh, it saw what Guardians of the Galaxy did. Yeah, and, and, and I was try like, that. great. Now they're just going to. But no, it was its own thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had some of that neon stuff, but it was that was like. But it was less yeah. nostalgia yeah. and more just aesthetic it's, than yeah. he liked. I was like, oh, that's really cool. You know, mm -hmm. he just he just likes the the style of it, rather than like, hey, he's not trying to 
cash grab on like, mm-hmm. hey, you remember the eighties? Hey, you remember the eighties? You know, yeah. hey, you remember the Walkman? Hey, remember the Walkman? You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't like that. It was like, oh, he actually just liked this aesthetic. Yeah. So I love that the satire Jojo Rabbit, funny as can be, um, with an actual message behind it. The guy just can't. He can to me right now. He can pretty much do no wrong. He was in the Mandalorian. He was in the Mandalorian. Mandalorian he, was yes. the, he was the android. Uh, the, the IG eleven. Yeah, he was the IG eleven. And the and directed the season finale. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, uh, he's he's a man after my own heart. Mm-hmm. So, uh, let's yeah. see the be- the worst of the decade. What did you hate about the last decade? Ah, oh, yes. So it was hard to pinpoint one thing in the gaming industry that was like you know the worst thing because it seems like i remember when i was you know 2010 and 11 Mm -hmm. we had the inclusion of uh unlock you had to get the in uh, on disc dlc remember when games had discs (laughs) (laughs) oh the old days uh 10 years ago (laughs) i say that but i bought a game on disc disc. like three days ago you guys were there i yeah yeah. oh i I buy all my stuff on disc so Mm -hmm. uh but so I think, you know, the worst thing that I remember, I remember them being outraged the most about, though. I'll pinpoint it for this one. Okay. The most I was outraged was when the Xbox One was first announced. Oh. Yeah. And no discs. Yeah. Mm. No, oh, yeah. The no, constantly having yeah. to check the internet. Yeah. So if you don't remember, because it had been a while ago, it actually, I was so mad at it mm-hmm. that I almost bought a PS4 <laughs> because I was just, like, done mm-hmm. with it. Uh, I almost bought a PS4. Luckily, I stayed with the Xbox One. Mm-hmm. But so what happened was is that when the Xbox One was first announced, they had uh, they were going to do no disc. It was going to be no disc. It was all download, mm-hmm. um, and you couldn't. So this is kind of and this was kind of the, the uh, no. You could do disc. Yeah, you, you could do it was on, but only for download. You, you yeah, you bought it just to download it, mm-hmm. and you couldn't give it to you. So let's say it was locked yeah, to your console. It was locked to your console, so you couldn't give it to your friend to uh, to play. You couldn't do backwards compatibility. It wasn't going to be a thing. Backwards compatibility wasn't going to be a thing. Uh, you couldn't do these things. You had to be constantly uh, if uh, you had to be constantly connected to the internet. It was going to be only internet services. Uh, and I believe. Uh, yeah, you had to be constantly. Uh, on, yeah, it, it would yeah. like every twenty four hours it would check your internet connection, and if you and if you didn't connect to the internet, it would like shut down until you were again. Yeah. Terry Wills Brown is tuning in, saying hi to everybody here at the phone booth. Hello. How's it going, Terry? Uh, so that was like I remember when someone the Xbox One was first announced. Oh, man, 2014? 2013. 2013. 2013. Yeah. 2013. Actually, it may have been twenty twelve because I think it came out in twenty thirteen. It came out in tw- uh, like November, like in the fall of twenty thirteen. Right. Okay. And then so I remember being a freshman in high school when it was when mm-hmm. it was being first announced, and so when that first came out, I remember like. I was like, nope, I'm done. Like, I was so frustrated. Like, I was like, I'm going to get a PS4. I don't care. Like, I, I it was my first summer job that I had. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm saving up for a PS4. That's it. You know, I'm not even going to try and get an Xbox One. They don't deserve my money. Like, I was like so mad that Microsoft, Microsoft I was like, they're not going to get my money. Mm-hmm. So, luckily, when they, luckily, and I wrote it, I remember this too. I wrote an email. It was my first angry letter I wrote to the company was uh, to Xbox. Wow. Was, you know, I was like, you know, how could you do this? And, you know, this is such a terrible... It was my first and one and only time that I ever did that. Mm-hmm. I was so mad. 14-year-old Parker was mad. Mm. Uh, so that was that was the big one for me of the decade. That was like... Now, now speaking specifically of 2013, I think there was one other video game-related disappointment you had that year. It really doesn't surprise me that there was. What? Aliens Colonial Mars oh, came out in 2013. Uh, yes. Before we, uh, my friend Katie Rogers is tuning in saying hi. How's it going, Katie? Hello. Now, with Hello, the, I'm Matt. Now. So. Oh, yeah. Now, with this game, ooh, there's a lot of PTSD right, no, behind this one. All right, so let me explain this yeah. one. This is a very personal story. This. Story time with Parker. Everybody gets sit down and get their hot cocoa because it's going to be a long one. Mm. So, 2013 happened. So, okay, so this starts, this story starts in 2007. I was mm-hmm. nine years old. I put on... Or no, I, I was at my I was at the library uh, that my mom worked at, and the only thing I really wanted to read was a Game Informer, mm-hmm. and they had Game Informer there. So I pulled it off, and I remember I was looking down the magazine aisle, and I just remember seeing specifically, uh, and I was a huge Aliens fan. You know, I watched Aliens when I was nine, like I don't know, mm-hmm. fifty hundred times at this point. You know, I could quote that movie like line for line. You know, and it was my favorite sci-fi thing. 
And lo and behold, I see a Game Informer that says, you know, it has the cover, like it has I the remember, Xenomorph. I remember, I got yeah. that issue. Yeah. And so, yeah, you remember the Xenomorph on mm-hmm. it? And I was like, and I just, like, I lit up. I was like, <gasps> yeah. Silhouette of the Xenomorph yeah. with the Marines and yeah. the lighting yeah. on mm-hmm. it. And I remember, I was like, <laughs> and so like, I was, <laughs> and so I grabbed it and I just started reading it, you know, mm-hmm. and, I, and this is, <laughs> this is like the, so, and it said it would come out like fall of next year. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, how wrong we were. So <laughs> it always did that. So basically from 2007 to 2013, every year it would say, oh, coming out this fall. 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 Till finally it said coming out February 2013. Yeah. And so I was like, <laughs> fair enough, fine. So I got, I remember I, I gotten uh, a GameStop card from, my, uh, from Christmas, you know. I just not was like great. I can I can pre-order. It's my first. I think it's like my first pre-order I ever had. And after that, I never did a pre-order, and this is why. Uh, it was my first pre-order I got. So I went to the GameStop, pre-ordered it. I was like, yes, okay. February comes around. February, I think it was like the, the day before Valentine's Day or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it was like February 11th. I think is actually when it was. So it doesn't really matter. So I get. So it's like two months later. You know, and I've been so really. It was like I've been waiting. You know, since I was nine. Mm-hmm. So, what, five years at this point? Because I was fourteen when it came out. So, five years. Uh, so I was waiting about five years for this to come out. And I get it. I get it. I played it. And actually, the first time I played it was with Ed. So yeah. we played it on co-op. I believe that's the first time I ever been to your house too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so uh, we went to co-op. We did the co-op. And, uh, well, to say the least, uh, uh, disappointed. Because not only that, and I forgot to mention this too, is that they, this is the infamous E3 trailer, right? Oh, the infamous yeah. three. So at E3, which is like a gaming convention that, you know, all the, all we nerds go to. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we've talked about E3. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just to refresh, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, so we go to E3. Or so I, I saw the trailer, uh, the E3 trailer. And it looked great, you know, like the lighting was great, the models and the texture was great, you know, mm-hmm. it, like the AI didn't wasn't, you know, you know, bad. It mm-hmm. was, you know, made sense, and the guns sounded good. Like everything sounded like an Aliens game, you know. When we get the game, mm-hmm. <laughs> and on the three on the Xbox three is this more the last generation, so three Xbox three sixty, it had X the original Xbox graphics, yeah. <laughs> um, with uh and the the audio was just off like it didn't sound good it just like horrible the ai was just terrible the story terrible they brought back hicks mm-hmm. you know who was supposedly supposed to be dead michael bean's character yeah michael bean's character i think michael bean even michael yeah bean he did even, yeah so michael bean even voiced him uh even though he's supposed to be dead canonically mm-hmm. in the series whatever um it, the story was just bad and like Fifty percent of the time, you know, it's aliens calling the rains. You don't even have like more than half the time. You're not even fighting aliens. You're fighting uh, the Wayland Company. The Wayland Yutani. You know, you Wayland Yutani Company. And so it's like, like the mercenaries. I'm like, oh, so and I tried for so long, so long to just, you know, say, hey, deny everything. Like it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. I like this. This is what I pay for. It's like the the burning house. I'm like, this is fine. Mm-hmm. This is fine. Oh, how wrong I was. How wrong and terrible I was. So, aliens, colonial marines. I forgot. About, I try and like suppress that memory because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just like. Ugh. Fun fact about aliens, colonial marines. I was actually reading a review for another another aliens game from 2000. Oh, was critical yeah. of it, and then they said maybe the recently announced Aliens Colonial Marines would be better. It took 13 years for that game to come out. <laughs> you know what else had a development cycle about that long? Duke Nukem, Nukem. Forever. Oh my god! Oh. You, know, you, know, you know who published both of those games? Gearbox. Gearbox. <laughs> Let us not be blinded by the Borderlands. Remember that Gearbox is Gearbox. When I was 12, I got Duke Nukem Forever. Who would buy that for a child? My grandfather. No. Oh. oh no. <laughs> well, he didn't know. He was just like, oh, he really likes. He looks. He, he likes the trailers. He likes the game. Obviously, I get it. And even for a twelve-year-old, okay, even for a twelve-year-old, I was like, this is really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is really stupid. This is this can't be any more crass than, than mm-hmm. this. It was really bad. Uh, 
like the jokes were bad, the humor was bad, uh, the gameplay was bad, so it was all bad, like two out of ten. So that was my worst of the decade. Thank you for reminding me Mm -hmm. of those. I I, I figured you may have forgotten about it. I Never forget your anger, child. I will use it Mm -hmm. in the future. So... What is your best and the worst? Brian, maybe I can remind you of some bad stuff and maybe we could both be traumatized. My best, which is a little qualified, is the rise of streaming. Now, Netflix actually did start the streaming service back in... Which we're streaming to you right now. Yeah, Netflix did start the streaming service back in 2007, but 2013 is when it had its first original show in House of Cards, a show that at the time was really good, and now we look back on with discomfort. Ah, yeah, it's a little... Ooh. Mm -hmm. And then we got things like uh, BoJack Horseman, we got Stranger Things, we got... I think you're talking about Netflix original shows or like original shows from like Amazon or Hulu that are actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. And these things allowed, you know, it allowed shows that never would have gotten made otherwise. BoJack Horseman never would have gotten made on a network or on a non-network. It never would have gotten the budget it needed. But it allowed these shows to flourish. It allowed shows canceled too soon to... To, you know, come back. It allowed shows that were canceled probably at their prime to come back as well. In the case of Arrested Development, let's not talk about it anymore. (laughs) Well, yeah. However, there is a qualification to that in that streaming also kind of sucks now. It's, uh, there are way too many streaming services that are divvying up the market, much in the way that channels on cable did. However, cable is also still a thing. I say cable, but you know what I mean. Oh, Mandalorian, too. That was good. Yeah, The Mandalorian was good, and for every good show... But now it seems that we've sort of hit a bloat, a bloat period, where everyone has to have their own streaming service, but they also want to keep, you know, the standard TV channels, but it doesn't work. Let's not forget that NBC has its own streaming service now. Peacock, it's coming. And it's not even going to have all their stuff, because Friends is going to HBO Max, which is separate from HBO Now and HBO Go, as far as I can tell. There's also DC Universe, which is sort of pseudo-folded into HBO Max. And then there's also Verve, which is also kind of related to that, because it's all owned by AT&T. AT&T is awful. Isn't it funny that, like, so you remember our ki- our parents told us, there were only three channels, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be like, there were only three streaming services. Yeah, we, had, we, we had, had the Netflix, the we Hulu. had the Hulu, and we had the Amazons. <laughs> and then now it's like, they got all them fancy, you know, YouTube. Uh, your Quibi. Red. What's your Quibi? Your Quibi. Your Go 90? That's actually dead already. <laughs> I remember, do you remember, like, I remember, like, in, I remember early, early, in like, 2010, 2011, I was, like, seventh grade or something. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a bunch of, like, quasi-streaming services coming out, like, kind of, like, you'd see them on Xbox 360 Live and stuff like that, mm-hmm. where they had just, you know, the random stuff, like... And, like, they did it for music, too. Like, remember when Zune was a thing? Oh. oh. Zune, you remember Zune? Yeah. Zune was a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember seeing that. I bought, actually bought a movie on Zune. I bought mm. Tron, the original movie on oh. Zune. So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I just, remember, yeah, so it was funny. You know, we go through these, the, mm. go through these phases. Yeah, you're right. We're going through a bloat. Now we have, like, 500. Anyway. Yeah. And it's not just, you know, movies and TV that start streaming, but also gaming. Now, gaming streaming is... Sponsored to you by Curiosity Stream. No. <laughs> gaming Ooh. streaming is sort of in its infancy right now, but it did start in 2019 with Stadia. Stadia kicked it off towards the end of 2019, so it's part of the decade, so I count it. Stadia is... <laughs> Gotta love how that was the launch point. <laughs> yes, and we're also getting a Xbox X Cloud, which is... Not really a consumer-facing thing like Stadia. It's going to be more for businesses and more in the background of it. They're not trying to sell it. But it's... Uh, I, I think that, while it does have significant issues, streaming as a concept that has risen, I think, is a good thing. I think it gives rise to better TV. I think it gives access, well, or yeah, at least used to give more access to consumers. You know, before streaming, okay, I didn't watch TV, mm-hmm. okay? Not because I, I didn't have it. I didn't want to. You know, yeah. I thought, like, all these shows that were coming out, no offense to anybody that likes these, but I didn't like them, which were, like, Vampire Diaries. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is there? Like, uh, True Blood. True Blood. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I love I'm just volunteering you shows. <laughs> it's just, like, hate. Mm-hmm. Um, why are the other ones? Like, oh, uh, the, even the CW ones. Like, I didn't like, um, or anything on <laughs> sci-fi, mm-hmm. you know. 
What? Ryan Barber is tuning in. He actually has a story about Zune. Yeah. He said, I found a Zune on the street one day when I was 13. I had it for a month and the firmware crashed. Yep. <laughs> Not a surprise. Luckily, you got it running for a month. Yeah. Uh, I see the one. So, yeah, uh, I didn't like Arrow. I don't like that show. I, I cannot relate to that. I know you can't. But I, I got as far as the first season, and it looked good, but I didn't think it would be as uh, it would go where it got. Arrowverse. Know. I think the only thing that I honestly watched when I was a kid was Burn Notice. Hmm. I think that was like, that was a good show. I think that was really the only thing. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. House, I watched like two seasons, and I got tired of it because it's the same thing every time. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, Mean Doctor. You don't binge House. You yeah. watch an episode at a time. Yeah. And Doctor, I watched Doctor Who. Um, on when it was on Netflix. That was really the only reason why I watched it. <laughs> Torchwood was good. I like Torchwood. Bring back uh, Torchwood. Bring back Torchwood. Bring back... You know what? Everyone... Oh, everyone's like... Uh, oh, I did like Supernatural, too. Um, yeah. uh, everyone's like, you know, Team Edward or Team Team Jacob. I'm Team Jack. Okay, I'm Team Captain, Captain Jack. Jack Harkness. Yeah, yeah I'm, mm -hmm. I'm Team Captain Jack Harkness, okay? That's my guy, all right? Mm -hmm. He is like a mixture of Tom Cruise and... Tom Cruise, you know, <laughs> just the ultimate pinnacle of just awesomeness. Uh, and no way. Uh, so, you know, I like those shows. I like those. But if it wasn't for streaming, I actually wouldn't have gotten into yeah. Doctor Who, uh, Torchwood. I wouldn't have even known they existed. Yeah. You know? So thank you for that. Um, but in that, yeah, I never watched cable TV, like any like network stations. They were just, mm -hmm. they're all kind of the same to me at that point. They all kind of had really bad dialogue and really bad acting. So, mm -hmm. yeah, couldn't watch that. And now for my worst of the decade is Disney buying everything. Everything, everything yes. Monopoly. So, yes, the biggest purchases are the 2018 or 2018, was it 2018 or 2019? Which one? Uh, the purchase of Fox, I believe. That was this last year. 2019. 2019, right. Yeah. It's the reason why they weren't able to buy all the Spider-Man right. Why they weren't able to buy Sony when people were proposing that. Right, because... The whole Spider-Man dilemma. Because we actually, like, started talking about it when it was first rumored on our yeah. first couple of So, yeah, it was 2019, they bought Fox. And in 2012, they bought Lucasfilm. And, you know, Star Wars and indie and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. And it's just... It's and become, Predator. They have Predator. Fox yes. From, yeah, they also have that. And I think Aliens, too. Yeah, Alien, Predator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have those. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know what? Thank you. I'm actually, you know what? I'll take a side to that. Thank you for purchasing that, because maybe they'll store it away. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that needs to be put on the shelf for a little bit. Put it with the Ark of Covenant? Yeah, put it with the Ark <laughs> of Covenant and uh, Walt Disney. <laughs> but yes, but it's also, it's concerning. One media company having all of this IP, oh. all this power... Ryan, yeah. Ryan says, leave Fox alone, Disney. And you know yeah. what? I agree with you on that. Yeah, just mm -hmm. put and it, it on the shelf. Let's and they out. have been sort of exerting control negatively. They've been letting fewer and fewer theaters use old Fox movies. Like, you know, there are the theaters, you know, the non-chain ones that show, you know, old flick marathons. Like, you know, Rocky Horror and the original mm. Alien and this and yeah, that. And they've, yeah. with the exception of Rocky Horror, because I think they realize how bad the backlash would be. Oh, they, yeah. They cannot get, they cannot try and remove Rocky Horror from theaters. This, yeah. But no. they have been, you know, hurting those old, those older theaters by refusing to allow them to use old Fox movies. It's a tragedy. It really is. And so, yeah, you know, the thing is that they own, they own Marvel. Mm -hmm. They own, uh, Lucas, Lucas films. films. Yeah. You know, which is basically Star Wars. Yeah. Um, they haven't done anything else besides Star Wars. Uh, yeah. They're working on a new indie. Working on a new indie. And then uh, they own Fox. So, like, those three, the big conglomerates, you know, the mm -hmm. big ones, you know, they, they own. Yeah. You know. However, mm -hmm. I would point out, mm -hmm. um, since Disney has owned this, since for, I'm only talking, in this case, I'm only talking about the Star Wars franchise. Mm -hmm. okay. Exclude Marvel for right now. Mm -hmm. um, they've had really good success with with Star Wars. In oh, some yeah. ways, I mean, like, outside of the main trilogy. Okay, okay. yes. Oh, that yeah, their movie. expanded yeah, universe. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Mandalorian's really good. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know everybody doesn't necessarily like Rogue One and Solo, mm -hmm. but I like those ones. I like those ones. Those are good. Those I, are good standalone stories, you know? I, I enjoy those. Uh, 
Rebels had its moments when it was mainly just referencing Clone Wars, but anyway. I gotta agree with you, though. I mean, when they originally uh, started working on the new trilogy and they said that a lot of the original canon was no longer canon. We got Jedi Fallen Order. Jedi Fallen Order, see? Jedi Fallen Order is good. They did better on Battlefront 2. I'll let that one slide for right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. It's they started to add more story. It's uh, better than the first Battlefront. Well, then there's yeah. a loot box thing. We don't, but they got rid of it. Yeah, but they, you know... You it p- took forever, but they got rid of it. You stab someone, you still get to hold that against them even if they remove the knife. True, true, true. true yeah, true, true. yeah. True, true. So, the, yeah, and but that's that's more... That's more about the industry and the gaming. Well, yeah, but it, yeah. it's all Disney tied like together. It. Yeah. It's a grand... Well, true, Disney was actually against it, and there was rumor that they were thinking of taking the license away from EA because of it. Yeah, it, that's EA. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. EA. That's on them, because mm-hmm. they want... Okay. Every EA was like, oh, we need loot boxes. Well, we need to do this because... Live service. Live service. Origin by origin. Surprise yeah. mechanics. Feed me. See so more? Me. It's like... <laughs> I was like, so, and then EA was, and then Disney was like, please stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what are you doing? A Jedi Fallen Order was basically that, like, no. You have to stop. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's time, time to, to stop. stop. <laughs> uh, so I was, I think that they're doing good with the Lucasfilm products. Because yeah. Before that, I mean, okay, as everyone wants to give guff about, uh, as everyone wants to give guff about the new sequels of Star Wars, okay, mm-hmm. the, the 7, 8, 9, okay, all right. Are they as bad as the prequels? Not by a long shot. I'd argue overall, yeah. You think so? I think so. I think uh, I think, think they're bad in different ways. Controversy. Let's go for it. Okay. So the prequels, the movies themselves were bad, but the story they were trying to tell was, I think, really good about the failure of the Republic and the Jedi and how easily they could be manipulated. And it shows, you know, the systems that protect us can't always protect us because they're fallible. Meanwhile, what what really is the story of the sequel trilogy? That is a good point. There is really no overarching story or theme to it. Well, it's it, it's very reactionary. Yeah, yeah. like J.J. Abrams made the first movie, and then the Last Jedi was sort of a reaction to that, and then and Rise the, of Skywalker was a reaction, reaction to, to the that. reaction. Yeah, it was never planned out. It was never a set of movies. Which give the prequels all the hate you want. They were planned. There yeah. was an end point. Right, right. You know, they actually had, mm-hmm. you know, you could write, he had a synopsis for these ones. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. There is that. However, mm-hmm. I can't get past the dialogue in, yeah. in the prequels because that is horrible. Yeah, so like I said, I don't George, like Lucas can't, George Lucas can't write a script. Yeah, and I do think fine. the movies were badly made. Yeah. But I think the overarching story they were trying to tell and how it fit in with Star Wars was good. Whereas I will say that the sequel trilogy really well made from a movie design level until you get to Rise of Skywalker with some sort of stuff. Mm. But I think the overarching story for it is just isn't there. There isn't a theme. And you know, to like it's been like I don't know three or four weeks since I've seen uh, since I've seen oh, two two or three weeks since I've seen uh, the Rise of Skywalker, and I still can't make heads or tails of it. Yeah, like, it's. Do I like it? Do I not like it? it? Like, how do I? I still don't know how I feel about it. I think mm-hmm. I have to rewatch it again just to see, like, mm-hmm. just to see how I feel about it still. Because uh, I think you have to watch it a couple of times to really understand how you feel about it. Because uh, mm-hmm. when I first watched it, I was like, "Oh, this is really interesting. It's really cool." And then I started thinking about it a little bit more. I was like, <sighs> "And it's do you take the well-made movies with no purpose, or the poorly made movies with a purpose?" Right. It's and it's just. That's why I sort of put them on equal footing there. You know, the problem, yeah, but here's like, I, I think they do have a purpose, but I feel like even though they're kind of, they're kind of lopsided, all right? Because the prequels, okay, George Lucas should have sat down and said, okay, the point of the prequels is to show how Anakin Skywalker turned from the good side, turned from Anakin Skywalker to Darth Vader. Yeah, and that's what he did. He sat down and said, that's the purpose of this. It's also to show how But the even Republic then, fell. it's very lopsided. It is. Because in episode two, he's a, he, he is a mean guy, okay? Like, he is a bad person, mm-hmm. you know? He's, like, cutting down sand, you know, sand people because he just... Mm-hmm. Because he just wants... I mean, obviously, he's, they they took his mom and stuff, but, I mean, for a Jedi, you can't... You, come on, man. You know, like, you can't just do that. I'd argue the Phantom Menace really has no purpose. 
You could take that one out and pretty yeah, much... Yeah, it's, if you fact, just started Attack of the Clones, you'd see, oh, Anakin's there, he's a Padawan to Obi-Wan, and we already kind of knew this from the original trilogy, so it wouldn't have really been, you know... There's a lot of... Uh, apparently there's a lot of, uh, you know, rec like, how to watch... Like, there's a lot of... Uh, how to yeah, yeah the, how to watch it and people will just say straight up, don't watch the uh, Phantom Menace because it doesn't mm -hmm. have any purpose. Just go straight to the Attack of the Clones. Yeah, I've seen four, five, two, three, six, and then the sequel, which <laughs> is watching movies shouldn't be this complicated, and it feels like that's actually on us, not really Lucasfilm. Well, yeah, I mean we for I I have so I have a, another story time because mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, when I was. When I was four, okay, the only movie that was, or three at a time, I think I was, three or four, I can't remember. It was right, right before Attack of the Clones came out, and Phantom Menace was the, Phantom Menace and 4, 5, and 6 were the only movies that were out at the time. So, I watched Phantom Menace, the, the first movie I ever watched of Star Wars was Phantom Menace, okay? My dad didn't tell me about 4, 5, and 6, I only knew about Phantom Menace, and I, so I was like, so I watched that dozens of times. And I remember this one time, uh, which is kind of funny. Like, it's not a kid's movie. It's not, really. It's like, as much as George Lucas wants to say, it's got a lot of politics in it. I didn't understand. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's... Well, I, I didn't understand the plot of the story until I was, like, 13. They 13. were kids' movies that weren't really made for kids. Yeah. Because ultimately, I do think we should look at Star Wars as... They're, they're kids' movies. For the most part, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, family movies. Yeah, fa okay, yeah. Family, family movies. That's I think that's a better description. Yeah. Family movies. Uh, so I watched, so I watched that one and my dad was like, Hey, there's three other Star Wars movies. Would you like, let's go and get them. Mm -hmm. And it was probably when you had VHSs. Uh, and I was like, yeah. And I thought there was two, three, and four. Like, so I watched the first one. I thought it was two, three, and four. <laughs> no, okay. So he didn't tell me about this. He didn't tell me that they were, and he didn't tell me when they were made. They didn't tell me how many, like they're, that this is the fourth, fifth, and sixth movie and that they were planning to make this convoluted thing where it's the prequels are one, two, and three. Yeah. So, so when I, he, so we come home and I, I actually didn't watch them the first day we brought them home. I don't believe, I think I watched them like three or four days later. I, mm. I don't remember. Uh, I remember it wasn't immediately after that. Uh, but I watched, I think I picked the fourth one out and I put it in and I I gotta tell you, I was so lost as a four year old. Like <laughs> I was like, wait, cause you, Oh, I remember is there's a Jedi Council, right? Like, there's a bunch of Jedis. There mm -hmm. should be a bunch of Jedis. And why is Obi-Wan... Wait, that's not Anakin Skywalker. That's Luke Skywalker. Who is that? You know, so I was like, wait, but who's Obi-Wan? Like, he's... I mean, Obi-Wan's old, you know? <laughs> I was like, wait. And I was like, where's the Jedi? I was like, oh, you can take care of Darth Vader. Where's the Jedi Council? We need the Jedi Council. And... <laughs> yeah. So, thanks, Dad. Uh, <laughs> for... So, now that I have that in mind, it really does matter. So, my point of this long story is that it really does matter how you watch these things. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like you should start with four. That's how it was made. That's how you should, that's the feeling of it. You know? Yeah. You yeah. Know? And then you go back and watch one, two, three. So, so, if you watch one, two, three, and then four, you realize that the there are a few continuity errors because George Lucas didn't have all this planned out when he first made four. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. so it's a good... And four, th four, five, and six, good ones to start off with. Mm -hmm. There's a point that you should watch them, how they were made, when they were made, not how they were made. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. That's how, that's my point there. So, hey, I actually had a That was a really story. good point. Yeah. I had a valid point on that. What so now, I uh, have one more person. Anyway. To the I, uh, I actually had a lot of difficulties trying to pick my best and worst because there's just so much to pick when it comes to best and worst, so... I kind of had like three categories, I guess, you know, for movies, uh, for video games, and for TV shows, because all three kind of impacted me, you know, within the decade and everything. Okay. Um, now, I had to start off with films. Now, when it comes to best movies, now, for a while, you know, before 2017 or so, when I first watched an old little film called Blood Debts, which actually got me into the film business and everything, I had no, like, real interest in like behind the scenes stuff visual effects or anything like that i was literally just somebody who watched a movie just to watch a movie and while a lot of my friends thought some movies were bad i actually thought it was good because i wasn't very critical or anything but the first movie that i ever watched that actually got me to genuinely appreciate visual effects would be edgar wright's scott pilgrim versus the world mm. 
I remember when You're I a hipster. No. I remember <laughs> when I was at Stag High School, you know, and um, I I wanted to be a journalist at one point, and it didn't work out in the newspaper business. But I was still an avid reader of the school newspaper that floated around. And I remember one time while I was sitting in math class, I saw the ad, one of, like the little column talking about the film, and I got real hyped. And I watched the trailers, I got hyped. Saw the game, I got hyped. So I sat down and actually watched the movie. And I loved its use of just the fact that it looked like a comic book fused with a movie at the same time. Like, I wasn't too familiar with that, you know? Like, um, the scene where he's talking to Knives Chow and she says that she loves him and you see the word just grow and you see him just kind of, like, turn away from it and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, those kind of visual cues I wasn't really used to, you know, because I didn't really, like, try and figure out a director's style. But after I watched that, I started, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd occasionally try and check out, you know, films that are like that and everything. So that would, it wasn't what got me into movies, but it definitely what got me to appreciate the visuals in a film, I guess. Now, when it comes to worst, that would have to be Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Oh, that psychedelic... Well, actually, in terms of being a psychedelic no, mess not. that's incomprehensible. It's drab and boring. Now, I have to admit, when I watched the movie, I, I did like it. And I will still watch it and enjoy it from a visual perspective. Because everything in it does look trippy and gothic and interesting, and that was good. However, looking back at it now, I do have to acknowledge that this movie was made in 2010. And this could be like the early as far back as I can go for the uh, furthest example that I can find of Disney starting its reboot trend after Alice in Wonderland did so well all of a sudden the Jungle Book got a remake and then after the Jungle Book they just started spiraling off after there picking other classics that they could try and remake Cinderella Maleficent Peter Pan mm -hmm. yeah. Cinderella and Maleficent yeah I got this Cinderella. yeah Beauty and the Beast mm -hmm. just they did another one I believe from Mowgli Ugh. They did, a, they did The Nutcracker, which was basically just Alice in Wonderland with a fresh Ugh. coat of paint. They did a sequel to Alice in Wonderland, though that one wasn't based off of a classic, so I'll let that one slide. Yeah, that was based off through the... Oh, wait, it's, no, not a classic the, Disney. Yeah. yeah. It's right. Tim Burton at his, at his most drab and most boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It turns out Tim Burton's aesthetic does not work with everything. Yeah. No, it's something just stop. Just and that is true. I mean, though that isn't as though, of course. I mean, I didn't pick this movie because of Tim Burton or anything. I mean, he does other movies that I think are really good. This just ha doesn't happen to be one of them. But the reason why I picked that to be the worst of the decade is because that seemed to set off the trend that oh, Disney doesn't need to come up with a brand new idea. We could just reboot something from a long, long time ago, and we still make money. And because of that. I feel that kind of impacted the reason why Hollywood seems to be running so dry on ideas right now because we're in reboot fever at the moment. Mm -hmm. you know? I can't help but feel like Alice in Wonderland was a, a con contribution to that. Mm -hmm. you know? um, yeah, but, it's bad. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, moving over to video games. Um, this is another one that I had to pick from a visual perspective because whenever I played games, I, as most people do when they play video games, the only thing you really think about is mechanics. You know, mechanics and the story. You know, that's usually what makes or breaks a video game, you know. But the first game that I ever played that actually got me to appreciate the visuals, you know, the nice coat of paint that's put over the gameplay and everything, is a, a little game called Cuphead. Hmm. Yeah. Hey. Bless you. Thank you. Now, I don't know how many years necessarily it took. I knew it took a long time to get Cuphead made. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you play it, it, you know, the mechanics itself is fairly simple. It's like a Dark Souls rail shooter kind of thing. You know, the bosses just naturally get harder and harder to beat. You die a lot of times and whatnot. Um, what I appreciated about it was its style. You know, I believe it was Studio Madhouse that did Cuphead. No. No, it wasn't Madhouse. I'm not thinking Madhouse. It was, it was some, some different... It, it was like two guys working on it. Two yeah, guys in a basement. Which is why yeah, I'm it, drawing a blank on it, yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, uh, Oh, I'm gonna look at it. Yeah, yeah. It was an indie game. It was two yeah. guys that did all the animations by hand. Yeah, every single every single picture in that game is hand drawn, and I I love that. You know, even menu interactions and whatnot. There, there's not none of it is like a little CGI animated thing that popped up. No, all of it was hand drawn, old school Felix the Cat style and everything. Yeah, based off the Match Life stuff, and it's a uh, studio MDHR. MDHR. I think that's why I said Madhouse. That was what I was thinking of. MDHR. You know, and that was what I had to say was my favorite video game of the decade, or at least the one that I appreciate the most, just because of how much effort was put into the style of it all. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to worse, this isn't particularly a video game, but more so a video game company. 
Um, again, back before 2017 and whatnot, I wasn't involved in movies, and movies was kind of what got me into pop culture in general to start looking behind the scenes for video games and everything. And for the longest time, I didn't realize just how evil EA Games was back when I started off the 2010s. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, you know, because I was always a generation behind everybody. You know, around when I was in high school, everybody was playing the PS3 and the 360, and all I had was a PlayStation 2. So I didn't really have too much exposure to EA except for the trailers that I would see at E3 and everything, and the brand new games that come out, and all the cool awards and nominations that are being given to these games. Back and when you had your long hair. My long Shirley Temple curls and whatnot, you know. But eventually have I did get... Have you seen that? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, it's great. Yeah, eventually, though, I did get involved into the pop culture business around 2017 and whatnot. And once I started looking behind the scenes and whatnot... That's when I started to come across more and more news headlines that pop up on sites like Kotaku and Polygon and whatnot. Just EA just doing so much stupid stuff. Just so many bad decisions. Mm -hmm. It did it bad. Yeah, and then looking back at it now, it's like I can't believe that in 2010, I thought that they were just one of the game companies out there. And looking back at it all the way now, I see all the things they've done wrong and it just kind of like mm -hmm. shatters the veil, you know? Yeah. yeah. My lord. I think EA stands out the most because they try to hide it the least. At least with people like Ubisoft and actors and they try to no, at least disguise not, what they do. EA's mm -hmm. just sort of they own it now. Yeah, like, yeah we're people bad. Hate them, remember, but remember you'll the, buy their stuff anyway. Yeah, remember the whole thing regarding FIFA loot boxes or whatever, how it was supposed to be banned everywhere else, and EA was supposed to get rid of their loot boxes, and they're like, well, we don't think it's gambling, so we're not going to get rid of them. Yeah, I think they're still fighting in Belgium about that. Yeah, the fact that every other company around you has made the smart move, and you decide to stand on your little mountain and whatnot. Parker, I think I know you know why they did that. Do you know why they did that? I do. I, I do know. Can you sum it up for me in one word? God, I, I can. I can try. Mm -hmm. I can try. I can really try. I'm, I can try. Okay. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me. Let me. Let me give it my best shot. I've heard okay. the legends of his tales. Okay. Uh, yeah. Money. There we go. There we go. Money it makes so much sense. A true story. <laughs> I was. I was entailing, it's riveting. Yeah. I, I have, my, my heart is crying. <laughs> I have actually something. Okay, you may not. Okay. This may have been a little hickory doodah in your back mind. Okay. Okay. So. What? <laughs> it's a hickory doodah in your back mind. Something you don't remember. Okay. Don't say, that. okay, fine. Okay. Don't pretend oh, it's okay. a thing, but just don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what it is, all right? All right. One of the worst things in television of the early 2000s, or, yeah. T 2010s. Yeah, the 2010s. Yeah, yeah. 2010s. In the early 2010s, Adult Swim programming. I can't actually comment on yeah, that. I can, I can agree with you on that. They had pretty, before what I call, you know, like, the Adult Swim renaissance, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was, like, Rick and Morty. They were, um, like, a liquid television era. Yeah, and it was, it was weird. It was a oh, weird yeah. time. Like, there was a show called Drunky Crow. I don't know if you ever remember Drunkie that. Drunky Crow. I, I honestly did not... I still don't really watch Adult Swim. It was... I watched it because I was 10, and you know what? It was, like, close as I can get to it. Adult mm -hmm. humor. So you're going to watch it, you know? Yeah. And... Or, um... What was that one? It was the... Uh, Witless Protection. That one... Ah. Uh, was on there. It was before, like... It was way before, like, SVU... NTSF, SD, SUV. Yeah. <laughs> PD, like, it was before that, it was before Rick and Morty, it was before, like, 2015. Yeah, like, for, like, up from 2010 to 2015, it was just kind of bad. Like, uh, what was the, oh, um, uh, it was the show, uh, the prison show. The prison pr Break? Pri no, not Prison Break. No, not Prison Break, break no. I thought that was Super Jail. Super Jail. That's what it was. Super Jail by Super Jail. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Super Jail was on there. China, Illinois. Yeah, China, Illinois. Like, oh, I loved China, Illinois though. But it was like it was. It wasn't funny. It was weird. Like, yeah. It was weird television. You know? Oh yeah. It was. It was that just that weird. Because like it seemed around the early 2010s is like their programs were really focused towards people 
who were intoxicated or under the influence, it seemed. Yeah, you like know, if they you were, were high or drunk, you wanted yeah, to see this. Part. They were literally dude whoa shows. Yeah, it was like. But remember off the air when that started? Oh, that yeah. whole thing is just super late night trippy visuals. In there case was you're out uh, of it. Xavier. Remember Xavier? Xavier. Yeah, oh my Xavier. god. Yeah, there was uh, like all these old, all these old ones. I, I still believe. Earlier, I but. still swear that that show had to have been made in Source Filmmaker. I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they were like, they were just weird. They weren't funny. They were weird. You oh, know? Ryan Barber actually tuned in and said that he thought Super Jail was amazing. It was good, but you know, it was. I, it, I really know. enjoyed the warden character. It, but, it was too. It was a little too weird for me, uh, which is hmm. surprising for me to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, like, I don't like. I, I do sometimes, but I like you know the cerebral kind of funny things where it's like huh. oh you need a you need a higher class of humor no not a higher class i just like dark humor uh <laughs> and these weren't these weren't dark they were just kind of super jail every episode ended with all the inmates killing kind of, each other it's just violent and gratuitous you know it wasn't like dark oh, okay you know? it was just kind of like oh look at what we can do oh, we're gonna stab each other oh, you know, okay well okay yeah. I mean, out of curiosity then what would you say was an Adult Swim show that did satisfy your need for dark humor, aside from Rick and Morty, because that's an obvious choice? Well, okay. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so that's everybody's go-to answer for that one. <laughs> dark humor. Uh, I would say, okay, it is random and chaotic. But the Eric Andre show. Or and Lord, and Lord Scott was good. Yeah? Uh, I like those ones better. I think that they, they kind of had a purpose of just being... Weird for funny, you know, mm -hmm. like that. It was funny because it was like, you know, wacky, and it was just like, oh, it's like everything. Was it had variety, yeah, too. and it was just, it just, it, it was a show about messing with people. Yeah, that's good. You know, like that, you can always get good reactions from messing with people. You know, you know. <laughs> so, so the thing. Oh, Ryan Barber brought up another good show that was from Adult Swim, Squid Billies. That was. I didn't understand a word they were saying, <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. Squid Billies know how was a, I feel with you. Squid yeah. was a good one. Squid was a show that I transitioned to like around the time that I like gotten kind of done with Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Yeah, which was a show that did cater a bit towards my dark side of humor. I'm not really like too dark, but like, yeah. I love just just the fact that they were all jerks. Yeah. Like, <laughs> did you ever watch Aqua Teen Hunger Force? I did not. Was yeah. that the one with like the French fry? Yeah, yeah. French fry, the shake, fry and the ball shake, meat. And, uh, <laughs> I never. Meat wad. Yeah. 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 Like and Carl, and Carl, he was my favorite. <laughs> uh, everything bad happened to him. Uh, everything. But yeah, there was like so like it was that weird time when like so like you had the mid two thousands. Yeah. Um, to the uh, to the two thousand tens or to the start of two thousand ten, which was really funny. So you had like Robot Chicken, Family uh, Family Guy was on it, but it wasn't. I wasn't was it Fam Family Guy was on there, but I don't mm -hmm. think it was the original. It wasn't meant to be put on there it was yeah, reruns but, of like the classic yeah, yeah seasons. It, family guy got canceled then it got put on reruns in adult swim and it got yeah. popular enough that fox brought it back yeah uh futurama was on there mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah let's see i think they even put new episodes on adult swim on there I, at one point in time they did that i believe so uh they had futurama they had uh let's see yeah, uh, Aqua Teen hunger force <laughs> ryan agrees with you that carl was the best he was the best, <laughs> he was the uh, best. They had Aqua Teen Hunger for us. They had all these really good shows. Uh, and then the mid-2010 the, the happened, and it just, like, stopped. It yeah. just stopped. You know, it was just like, okay, now we're just kind of, you know, we're out there for, like, super bad humor, where it's like, you know, you got to be high or something to, to get it, you know, to understand. Yeah. And that can be funny sometimes. Don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a buzzkill. But oh, yeah, yeah. Like, no, I definitely agree with you. The early 2010s was where it was at its worst. When it yeah. got into the later half of the 2010s, they still managed to keep that weird style. But oh, Tim they, and Eric show was good, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But then they, they found a way to, like, kind of suppress it a little bit to where it's still weird, but it still made some sense. Yeah. Like, I, I, always, I, I always say one of my favorite adults swim shows is john krasinski's dream corp llc mm -hmm. where um the real where the places that take place in reality is very like uh, the office style humor and everything with the camera shots mm -hmm. and whatnot but mm -hmm. when they go it's about this show about this uh group of people that like use dream conversion therapy they go into your dream and when they go in your head it's like this weird rotoscope world like the old school adult swim bumpers that was all trippy visuals oh, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you go inside the person's dream world and you'd find the source of their problem and rewire it somehow and like at the end of the day like the patients that would go to dream corp all of a sudden they're 
problems were fixed. Yeah. But I loved it because like in the dream, things were trippy and like it made no sense because you're in a dream and usually things are a lot more lucid than like Inception wants you to believe. Yeah. You know, but when you're outside of the dream world, things were normal and there was a, there was some pretty good dark humor. Uh, the guy that did the voice of Wheat, Whitley the robot from Portal 2. Yeah, Wheatley. He yeah. actually was a he actually did a voice in Dream Corp LLC as the yeah. robot there. Yeah. And uh, John Greer, the guy known as uh, Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. He's one of the main oh, yeah. scientists on that show. Well, you know, I think, yeah, and it, it got better around 2013 because mm-hmm. they had Lawyer Squad came on, um, Eric, uh, Eric Andre's show came on, uh, you know, you had Rick and Morty coming on, it mm-hmm. was good, it was, it was getting good, it, it was like, but that three to four year period in 2010 to 2013 to 14, which, yeah. which was like... It seemed like they weren't sure what they were going to do. Yeah, and it was like, uh, you know, so... That's I think that's like the worst on television at the time yeah, for me because that's the only thing I watched. Fair like, enough. That Fair on enough. television was that. You know. Now, when it comes to best TV shows, I actually had to sit down and think about it. You know, because for a second I really wanted to say Final Space, a show that recently had come out uh, last year on TBS. No, I think the year before that actually. Mm-hmm. It was the first show that me and my brother had binge watched from start to finish. You know, made by Olin Rogers and everything. They're on two seasons now, and I thought it was good. But I had to say that my favorite show of all time was BoJack Horseman. Yeah. You know, the Netflix original series. Because while I admit there have been shows that I watch occasionally where like one or two episodes might be a very serious subject. And that episode makes you want to feel, you know, BoJack Horseman was the only show where I felt like every single episode wanted you to feel. It's just that each episode taught you a new feeling, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, I remember I was telling you about this set where I was 16 and that show first came out. I wasn't ready for it mm-hmm. because... I thought when I saw the trailers, I thought it was supposed to be like a funny show, you know, mm-hmm. and it is a funny show. Don't get me wrong. It, it has its really funny moments, but it deals with serious topics mm-hmm. and there's a lot, you could go through like, you know, a whole episode with not too much of a funny moment. It's a very serious episode mm-hmm. and with maybe a couple of laughs in there, you know, mm-hmm. uh-huh, like a chuckle or, you know, mm-hmm. uh-huh. but the, the focus of the show wasn't to be funny. It was to tell a story mm-hmm. and I didn't really know that at the time. And I watched the first two episodes, and I kind of tuned, and I was like, no. It wasn't until my freshman year of college where I got into it, where I was like, oh, this is actually a really good show. Mm-hmm. And I binge watched it with the four, four seasons, like, I don't know, a week or something like that. So. Oh, yeah. It, uh, I remember for a period of time that I, like, my main goal was to make it to Hollywood, like, no matter what, you know, because, yeah. like, that was, like, that was the dream to me. Ever since I was a little kid, if I wasn't going to be able to be an inventor, then I wanted to be a director or somewhere in Hollywood. You know, so for the longest time I had this illusion that, you know, I heard there were some scandals here and there, but there's no way that Hollywood could possibly be that bad. And then I watched BoJack Horseman, and I saw this one episode, I forget if it was from I, somewhere between the first three seasons, and it was a flashback of BoJack, you know, with his manager, Herb Kazaz, you know, and they're both standing next to each other, and he's like, do you see our future ahead of us? It just looks beautiful. And then it shows, it cuts over to what they're looking at, and they see, like, this cutout billboard of, like, a sunset, and it looks all beautiful, but over that cutout is the sun setting, and it's, like, getting dark and pink behind it, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, like, just scenes like that and the tones that they would show and everything, you know? It really gets to you, and mm-hmm. I, I just can't help but appreciate just how much care and effort was put into that show, you know? Even though at first glance, it's easy for anybody to kind of see the animation style and look over, you know, what how much of a hidden gem it is. Yeah, you know, I grew up around... You know, for someone... You know, I grew up around the entertainment business pretty much all my life. Like, I've been... I've been dragged to the Stockton Symphony since I was three uh, with my dad. My dad had been, uh, you know, a musician working as uh, doing it uh, in his band. So and I've been around the entertainment business for a long time. Uh, always near it, never in it. So my dad was in it. But, you know, you just see that it's a really, it really does show like the really dark side of entertainment, the dark side of uh, what people go through in the entertainment business, you know, depression, anxiety, separation because of, of uh, infamy. Uh, you have uh, people taking advantage of people's lies and deceptions, you know, d- fooling people, you know, kind of BSing people, to put it mm-hmm. lightly. Um, mm-hmm. And it was interesting. And it was like, yeah, this is a really good, this is what, you know, this is what it's like to be in the entertainment business, no matter what you are, agent, actor, Manager, producer, uh, producer, producer. Yeah, mm-hmm. sorry, producer, doing production. Uh, 
this is the life you will live. You will live in a world where everybody is trying to one up you, deceive you, and lie to you. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, and that's it. Really, like it hit home for me. Like that was like, I felt the connection on that side of it. Cause I, and like I said, I've never done that, but I've been a part of it. So it's really interesting to see that. Mm, so definitely. Now, when it comes to the worst, I'm sure you guys will agree with me that it is definitely a, a big a contributor to possibly being a bad a bad show of the decade. Um, but a lot of people out there might be might disagree with me on this one, and you know what? That's fair. But when it comes to like one of the worst shows of 2010, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to give it to The Big Bang Theory. Yeah, you know it. <laughs> I think yeah. it started out promisingly. I think it started out not necessarily as mean-spirited as it would become. Yeah. I remember when I first started watching The Big Bang Theory. Again, this was before I was super critical of everything, you know, and I was, and I was able to enjoy it. Well, not super it. critical, just critical. More, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was actually critical of things, you know. But before then, I could just watch anything and nothing would bother me. And The Big Bang Theory was one of the shows that I thought was just the most hilarious thing ever, you know. And I watched, like, almost every episode, you know. And then eventually I started to review movies, you know. When I had my show, Miserable Media, over on Delta College. And I started talking about, you know, what makes a movie so bad and everything. And then I started watching The Big Bang Theory. And I just so happened to watch a video from... Uh, recently it actually contributed to it even more. I watched a video from Wisecrack that talked about what went wrong with The Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize until at that point a large portion of the laugh track that was used in The Big Bang Theory didn't even apply to a real joke. Yeah. You know, and I've heard that trope before that the laugh track could be used on anything. It's always Sonny did a great job of, make, of parodying the laugh track when they tried to make their own show. But I, I was like, okay, yeah, audience is fake. That's fine. You could toss it in anything. But I didn't realize just how many times they laughed and there wasn't a joke. It's just, oh, I'm going to say this word. Ah. Yes. Look, and sir, we, we said the name of a, of a Star Trek thing. Yeah. Insert, yeah, insert pop culture reference now. I wonder what Albert Einstein would do. <laughs> yeah, and see, it started out as, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't great in its depiction of, you know, nerds and nerd culture, but it was at least trying. But as it went on, it just got mean. I felt like they could, if they had stuck, like the series itself feels so much different than the pilot episode. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because, like, I don't know, the pilot. Let's not forget the spinoff, Sheldon. Young, Young Sheldon, Sheldon. Young Sheldon, still going. Uh. Yeah, and it just as the show went on, it became mean. It became racist. It became sexist. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't say it became sexist. There was actually now that I think about it, very, very sexist, sexist from, from the beginning. beginning. Yeah, you know, it what? desperately wanted to make nerds like the the thing to point at and laugh at. Like, yeah. oh, they're saying nerdy stuff. Let's laugh at them for being nerds. Ha, ah, you nerds! I don't think you guys are nerds. I love you guys. Mm -hmm. But oh, I'm. A, you know, yeah. But nonetheless, you know, I, I accept it. Mm -hmm. it. It was after it was it was after I realized how that show kind of deceived me. You know how, just how formulaic a lot of other shows can be on television and everything. So, I guess at the end of the day, I have to put that show under my list of like my worst television show that I watched of the decade. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Bad. But anyways, with that being said, we're about five minutes over the hour, so unfortunately, we are going to we have to... We don't have to do anything. We need to stay here and talk. How's your day? How's your day? How's your uh, well, day? How's your day? day? How's, your day? <laughs> How's your day? How's your day? How's your day, Brian? back, wrap up. <laughs> while, they're, while they're wrestling, let me uh, wrap this thing up here by saying, if you enjoyed this show, please tune in every Saturday and Sunday from 1 to 2 here on TVOSJ, the voice of San Joaquin where we cover all things pop culture related. Anything from movies to video games to TV shows, shows to comic TV, books. You, you name it. it. And we we got do it. our very best to cover it. We got it. You name it. We got it. We're like the best. Don't touch my calculator <laughs> watch, you peasant. So. Is, there an, is there any like shows or movies that you, you want us to talk about? Is there any news that you see things. out there that, that you want us to mention? Please <laughs> let us know. We are always yes. down to positive or negative feedback. Any feedback is appreciated. It doesn't calculate comic books. Now, <laughs> with that being said, I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap things up are we? here. Oh, uh, hang on. In that case, I'll be back um, over here. He's going to set up our super awesome theme song. Investigate 311. Investigate the Snyder Cut. We need it. We need the Snyder Cut. Okay. We need the Snyder Cut. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. Investigate the Snyder Cut. It is It is in Snyder's house, and I am going to pull a Mission Impossible to get it. Brian, why are you in my kitchen? Why are you in my fireplace? Why are you doing that? 
Why are you? Why are you in my bathroom? Go wrap up the show. <laughs> now, now with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, please have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful afternoon.